We're determined to become the number one social media platform for the property industry. We're never ever going to be in a position to replace the value that people get at face-to-face -face events like the Property Developer Show. But what we can certainly do is carry on the conversation after. If people realised how difficult it is to get into property and then sustain, you know, just even a couple of, of, of properties, may, maybe we would have a better rap as, a, as an industry. I'll have to put an app in now for five years time. It's mental, isn't it? To get a decision in 20, 2030 or more. Yeah, it's not something that we're, me and you are going to influence too no, much, no. but we'll do what we can certainly to help this sector. It depends. Angela, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Property Developer Show, the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Chris Tremlett from UK Homes Network, the first social media platform that's specific to property people. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So I think we've kind of evolved in terms of our relationship, obviously, with the show and obviously the the, the, the social media platform that you've yeah. got. Obviously, there's a lot of synergies and crossovers with, with what we're sort of trying to do, which is ultimately make the, the the property world a better place than it than it already is. Yeah. So in terms of your kind of background before the app, we'll get into obviously the app and what goes into it and, and maybe give people a bit of a demo today, potentially. Yeah, um, yeah. And what kind of background did you have prior to the app and where did that idea sort of come from? Yeah, so I started uh, about 12 years ago in a state agency. So I was whizzing around town, basically booking in viewings, going around. Um, and my sort of bread and butter, if you like, was the repossessions, the the ones that really stank, the ones that no one else would touch. Uh, and I loved it because I got an opportunity to speak to loads of developers, investors, landlords. Um, and that really sort of sparked fire in me working with them and quickly got promoted to valuer. So started going out and doing valuations but those horrible properties, the ones that no one would else touch, basically kept calling me back. So uh, I was um, going out and doing these properties, again, meeting more developers. And as time went on, um, I, I sort of ran out of, of steam within the estate agency world, as a lot of people do, um, you know, going into people's properties, then thinking the houses are worth a hundred grand more because they've given it a lick of paint and it's clearly not. <laughs> um, so... I decided to, to retrain in, in marketing and um, that was sparked by really understanding what the, the relationship was between buyers and property and why it was, um, what, what really encouraged them to, to go out and buy it. And particularly with estate agents, they're not very good at marketing. They'll go out, they'll offer Zoopla or Rightmove. Um, and I felt that there could be more to be done within the industry in terms of how we present the property, the kind of ways that you know, when stuff is being posted, what, what's the optimum time that people are going to see that property online? That that kind of stuff. So that that led me into marketing. Um, and I was quite fortunate to work for a, a house builder, um, someone quite well known. I also worked for a bridging lender and also a broker. And then more recently found myself in the prop tech sector. So this again was calling me back to the sort of developer side of things working. Uh, the, the product was basically sourcing land. Um, and we created a, a community-based platform where the developers and investors could network. Um, and I was at the forefront of that, if you like, where I was encouraging the conversations, really sort of touching base with those developers, finding out what their pain points were, you know, what what around the industry is affecting them, whether it's planning, whether it's nutrient neutrality, that kind of thing. And unfortunately, I was made redundant um, back in November, which kind of gave me the kick up the ass that I always needed to, which is is to go out and, and basically start working for myself and, and interacting with these developers a little bit more. So that's where UK Homes Network came in. Nice. So where did like the actual idea of the app come from? You know, what how do you sort of spot that that gap in the market, so to speak? Yeah, so even right from the early days of my estate agency career, I was the guy that was asked to do the social media because I was always on it, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether I was posting properties or whether I was just sort of dropping customers' messages, that kind of thing. And um, I've kind of just by osmosis have absorbed all the information over the years of, of using social media and trying to work out different tips and tricks with it. And 
for the average estate agent, let alone the average developer, using social media is a minefield. Mm -hmm. Whether it's algorithms, whether it's you know sort of spam messages that fill up your inbox, we all receive it on a daily basis just in our personal lives, let alone in our professional lives. So the idea was that we could create a social media platform that was simplistic for everyone within the industry to use, but it would maximise the ROI of the time spent on it. Mm -hmm. So the difference between, say, something like UK Homes Network and you know some of the other traditional platforms is that it's not a popularity contest. So when you're posting into our network, everyone sees it, mm -hmm. um, which ensures that you know, you're getting sort of more eyeballs on your content. The algorithms aren't determining who who sees your content and who doesn't because we've already verified the network of property professionals in there. So mm -hmm. we know it's 90% likely going to be relevant to, to our audience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I guess taking it from that like initial idea to delivering the idea, obviously they're two different things as I'm sure you're well versed in. What was that kind of process? How did that sort of evolve over time? Was it I've been made redundant, right? I've been thinking about this idea for a long time. Let's just go and develop it and deliver the app. Like where, how did that sort of process come to life? To be honest, it was, um, we had rumors circulating that there was going to be redundancies. It wasn't the first time. Um, so I, I overthink to the absolute max. Um, I catastrophize everything in my head. So I have to have a number of different solutions lined up in my head for anything that happens. And this was just one scenario where I had to make sure that I was prepared if I was going to be made redundant. So I'd looked at, you know, potentially rewriting my CV, making sure that all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And as I was filling out my CV, I was like, do I really want to work for someone else again? And do I want to go through another minefield of potentially being made redundant? Um, there'd been a situation in the past where I'd worked for some people and felt maybe that I could have done a better job. And I know that might sound arrogant to say, but sometimes you, when you've got that outside perspective, looking in on a business um, and the way it's being run and, and people are not listening to the, the, the people around them, there, there is something to learn from that. So I decided that having gotten halfway through rewriting my CV, that the idea of going through an interview process and, and you know, go, going in that six month bed and in period where you start to learn a new company and how they operate and, you know, sort of the office politics that are going on. Mm -hmm. I realized I couldn't put myself mentally through that again. Um, and that that's all quite negative, but the positive side of it was that I felt that I was in a better position than I've ever been in my entire life to be able to to start a business. So for, for a bit of context, um, 18 months ago, I gave up booze. Um, so I've completely stopped drinking. Um, I'm sort of almost 33 now. So um, financially, I'm you know not on the same salary that I was on when I was you know just starting out on it in a estate agency. And myself and my partner, we're not in a position where we have kids yet. Or, or we've got, you know, sort of assets tied down that we need to, to fixate over. So I realised that I'm now in the position where I can actually go out and start a business. And if I don't do it now, I'm going to massively regret it. Mm -hmm. So I had to take the leap of faith, not just for myself, but, you know, to, to ensure that I was maximising my potential for the people around me. Um, and, and that's, basically where it happened. So there was a negative and a, and a positive side to it. You know, there was like, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? And actually you could be doing this for the rest of your life. Mm, yeah, so. yeah. So in terms of then, I suppose, going from that kind of mindset to then developing the app, did you already have that kind of uh, contact with who was going to develop the app? Was it sort of already in your mind, you know, had you already sort of mapped out what that app was going to look like exactly? What what kind of went into to that side of it? Yeah, so we, obviously because my previous role, before I was made redundant, um, I'd had the opportunity to work with some developers before. I knew what was available out there. 
Um, so oh, app developers, not property developers. Exactly. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I do kind of get them mixed up in my head sometimes. Um, you do, oddly enough, because we've got developers written on our website, we do get a, quite a few app developers coming onto the website just checking us out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was a case of that we. I, I already had the experience of working within that market, knowing um, sort of basics of what goes into building an app um, and th the potential of, of what could be available. So it wasn't like I was going into this completely fresh or, you know, there's some chats on LinkedIn about prop tech founders having no experience within the industry whatsoever. And and that wasn't the case for me. I, I, I had not only had a background in property, but I'd also had a background working with software developers mm -hmm. to ensure that we were getting the right product put out, but also that the, um, the customer journey was, was as ideal for, for anyone using it. And that, that's still something we're working on to this day, but you know, it, it's a lot further forward than had if, if I'd come up with a solution that I, I didn't necessarily have experience in. Absolutely. So fast forward into today then apps developed, what's the sort of key features on the app? I don't know if you've got the app with you now. Oh, there you go. It's a blue Peter moment here. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah, this is the um, the main network. This is once you open the app, this is what everyone comes into. And you can see there's a, a multiple of different options there. <clears throat> so we've tried to keep it as simple as possible and as easy to find as possible. Um, the main part that everyone wants to come into and, and start networking straight away is the network itself. And this is set up exactly the same as you know traditional social media in the sense that you've got a feed here with people posting uh, information, sharing uh, case studies, talking about what's happening within the industry, sharing video content, images, links to their website. Um, so it's it's nice and simple. And you can see there's quite a few discussions that are ongoing at the moment. The great thing about this is that, when it, as I said earlier, once you post into this, it's not a case of how many connections you've got. Everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're maximising your exposure within UK Homes Network. We've also got our Opportunities tab. Um, so this is available to our premium customers. Um, so we've got land match, house match, and commercial. They basically work off the principle that when I was working with developers and land agents, land agents were coming to me and saying that they typically will only work with 10 developers, 10, 10 good developers. And they'll go to them with a piece of land and say, look, I've got this. This is a, a great deal. Do you want to buy it? Now, if a developer's got 10 plots already in planning, they're not necessarily going to be in a position to, to purchase that. And that happens quite a lot to land agents where they're, they're in a position where they've got a deal, but their immediate developers that they want to work with are not in a position to buy it. So that they then have to make a, a choice whether they keep trying to go off market or they sell it to sell on Rightmove or, or Zoopla or mm -hmm. Prime Location or all those kinds of ones. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a reputation within the land market that if you put a, a piece of land on, on one of the big portals, people start to question the viability of it because it's available to every man and his dog. Mm -hmm. um, so they were kind of looking for a halfway house where they could post sites that are off market, but not necessarily... Um, available on the open market, as it were. So in here, you'll be able to find lots of different posts from land agents, developers sharing their requirements directly with the land agents. Um, and yeah, we, we've had one or two deals done off the back of this. So it's, it's it's positive. And the, the same works for commercial and, and house match. So if there's property investors or you know developers that are looking at maybe HMOs, flips, that kind of thing, then they can share those within the, within that platform. Um, we've also got a media centre, which I'd advise everyone that's watching this, go and have a look. We've got some uh, incredible uh, webinars starring uh, yours, <laughs> yours truly, truly in there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we've also got an events tab so people can keep up to date with what events are going on. So obviously one of the main features is the look Property Developer Show. Um, you can see that's right at the top there so people can put their tickets through the app. Um, but yeah, we've got a whole host of partners and events that are being shared. So if you want to keep up to date with networking events and everything that's going on in the industry, um, as I say, we've got webinars, podcasts, uh, articles all being shared in there. And then I'll just finish on uh, health and well-being. So 
uh, it's not very well known, but Cambridge University did a study uh, about two or three years ago where they found out that one in three property professionals have reported to have a, a mental health issue or a mental health disorder. Mm. Um, I am actually one of those uh, statistics. So I, I got diagnosed with a mental health disorder when I was 26, um, which got diagnosed well before my estate agency career. <laughs> might, might have served, saved a, a lot of anxiety, but um <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that's helped me is is being surrounded by content and information around mental resilience, stress management, all that kind of stuff. And um, we've got two experts in the health and wellbeing group that are sharing regular content on those kinds of things. So things that we can all attribute to our daily lives, whether that's, you know, sort of stress management, resilience, mental resilience, all that kind of stuff. So all our members get to to come in and check that out for free. Um, so we've got Chris, who is a uh, wellbeing coach, business coach, um, and he also specialises in um, uh, an- alcohol uh, dependency. And then we've also got Alison, who has worked in the built environment for about 15 years. Um, she retrained as a hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. So every day she's, she's putting content in there um, to help our, our members out. So yeah, there's there's quite a lot going on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's uh, definitely multiple layers to to the app in terms of it's not just I suppose about well I guess it's one place where the property community can come together because I think I don't know if uh, it's just me but Facebook now like Facebook groups it seems so complicated to try and follow that you're just almost overwhelmed with information and how the algorithms work. Whereas this seems to strip that back to its basic form, which is depending on what time you post, you'll be at the top of the timeline. And then obviously everything else that comes in there with the networking is is obviously a lot more straightforward than what Meta have in place at the moment, which is a great solution to obviously, I I guess, keeping the industry connected, making sure that the right information is getting in front of the right people rather than just being driven by algorithms, which are often driven by hate or some form of, 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 engagement in that capacity unfortunately i think it brings it definitely back to uh to that sort of environment which is obviously i assume what you're trying to create with the app yeah definitely it's 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 the same as the the property developer show in the sense that together if we're better connected if we're you know sort of meeting regularly and talking about what's happening in the industry we we can combine to raise standards right across the industry because we're, we're we're setting a precedent for for what it should look like um we're never ever going to be in a position to replace the value that people get at face-to-face events like the property developer show. But what we can certainly do is carry on the conversation after. And that's where I think UK Homes Network really, really helps people. So obviously they can post publicly, you know, within the network and our, our, our other groups, but there's also a direct message function so that we can capture those relationships and, and ensure there's longevity there between the conversations that are going on, the discussions. And, and like you rightly pointed out, out, you know, the algorithms have been used to keep people in an echo chamber and um, fuel different kinds of conversations that you'd never normally have in real life. Whereas what we're doing is is ensuring that the the level of um, expertise is is given the exposure that it deserves, mm-hmm. um, and and that's where I think UK Homes Network is going to have a positive effect on on property. I think that's so important that that is a sort of vital thing that this industry misses that often those that get the most engagement or the best reach are those that are not all the time, but most of the time, not the right people you should be following within this sector. I mean, I've had phenomenal guests on this podcast that, you know, have not got that big of a following, but Mm. because they're out there actually doing it. And it's because they're, you know, not tapping into the algorithms. They haven't got a full-time marketing manager that's doing all their stuff and trying to tap into the fact that they're selling a course or something like that. They're just genuine people that are cracking on within this sector. And hope, you know, that the app is a place where people can go network with genuine people that aren't just there to hit the algorithms, aren't just there to be the smoke and mirrors. It's all about providing genuine value, which is obviously where we align and why we've definitely done a bit of business together over yeah, this yeah. year, because that's what we want to deliver with the the show. And that's what you want to de- deliver with the app for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, what some of the speakers you've had at Property Developers Show are, are exactly what we are, are trying to champion within UK Homes Network. The ones that are not talking about 
how easy it is, how much money there is to be made. The ones that are telling them, you know, my, my marriage nearly ended in a divorce as a direct result of this particular investment or this deal. Um, and if you can flag those warning signs to enough people, yes, some people might be discouraged from actually going out there and developing their own properties, but the ones that do want to go out and do it and the ones that are are motivated by what they've heard will have enough resilience, have a, have enough understanding of what the pitfalls are and be better armed to make better properties. Um, and, and that's definitely something we want to encourage. Absolutely. So it's good to hear. Good to hear. Good stuff. So in terms of like the next sort of period for the app, what does that kind of look like, you know, in terms of um, users, engagement, you know, what, what does the app look like in a finished mind for, for Chris? Yeah, uh, well, it, it's really funny. We, we've kind of been taking stock recently of, of how far we've come in such a short period because we're only six, seven months old. Um, and not many people know this, but I didn't have a database of email addresses. I didn't have, you know, um, vast amount of contacts that I could rely on when we launched. So when we launched, it was zero in my inbox. It was zero uh, emails we could send out. Um, so we've gone from zero to, we're, we're closing in on 600 now, 600 members within UK Homes Network. And that's just over a six, seven month period. Um, so the idea is, is that we want to grow to critical mass as quickly as possible. So that ensure that there's enough networking opportunities in there for people, that there's enough content, enough conversations being shared. Um, and that's really it, is that if we, we ensure that there's enough people in there, um, and uh, that there's enough conversations going on, um, then sky's the limit with this. We're, we're determined to become the number one social media platform for the property industry. Um, I don't think there are any others, but I mean, you know, it's always good to be number one. Um, and, and that's really where we want to go over the next six to 12 months is, is ensure that everyone's using our platform and everyone's finding value out of it. Um, but there's loads of stuff we can do from a, a product side. So we're already, you know, exploring what we can do in terms of how people are finding deals through the platform, um, the kind of conversations that are happening and the levels of exposure that people are getting within the platform. Um, so obviously having a property background and a marketing background, I'm always looking to ensure that our customers are getting more exposure, that their businesses are being profiled better. So yeah. It's uh, it's going to be an interesting ride over the next 12 months. Certainly, it's going to be an exciting one to watch, that's for sure. I mean, since I've kind of been involved in the app, I, obviously, I, I think you've tripled in size in terms of the users and obviously with the compound effect, that's only going to speed up, get better. Yeah quality of people that are joining obviously is improving the businesses you've got involved in it it's amazing to see and obviously it goes without saying the property developer show, show being involved you know so um it, it's amazing to see and i think there's definitely a need for it in the sector because you know the the, the actual social media apps are just yeah like i said for me and I'm a millennial, you know and uh, yeah, yeah. just on the edge of gen z and it's facebook to me is like trying to it's like a kryptonite you know you need a degree just to get, just to enter a group these days yeah i mean I, I remember when i started a state agency and started using it versus what it's like now and i took over covid because it was so negative i took a break from facebook actually deleted my account and when i came back to it how it had changed as a platform i mean it's it's completely different to what oh, it was, it's, you know, it's... even just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So how people are managing to navigate that platform now is is beyond me. No, uh, you and me both, you and me both. And it seems that not everything, but a lot of, I suppose, engaging posts are driven by some sort of hate or, you know, a level of engagement that isn't really improving the world. It's just put in front because it's quick hits. It's that need for... I don't even know what it is that we're after doom it's, scrolling and, you know. It's who can who can race to the bottom for the most controversial opinion. Mm -hmm. They might not even believe it themselves, mm -hmm. but I, I purposely banned myself from reading X before 12 o'clock in the day because mentally I can't cope with it. <laughs> if I read X before 12 o'clock, I know I'm going to have a really bad day. Um, wow. Just because people are putting on there and it's, it's not even thought out well thought out intelligent content it's i've taken a news story now i'm going to run with how controversial i can be to engagement farm mm -hmm. and 
I think what's quite cool with UK Homes Network is that just won't wash. If if you're being, you know, deliberately controversial, there's enough experts in there to to give you the proper information yeah, and yeah. and how it is. It's almost like you're stepping into a room where you you just can't be there's no fools within this room. You can't say that you've got financially free in seven days to six hundred professional investors that are, yeah. are doing it because everyone would be like are you all right <laughs> <laughs> basically yeah yeah so i think it provides that that platform and that or uh, yeah i guess it is authentic piece for people to go there and they know that this is going to be uh, an area where there's there is expertise and there is good quality people that aren't just chatting utter garbage about yeah, yeah. what property is like there's people in this group that are genuinely out there developing flipping landlording you know and everything else in between and i think that's where that's the beauty of the app that you've created for, for sure in in my opinion anyway yeah definitely we, we want to give a voice to those that are finding it difficult out there at the moment and i think long term what we want to do is is create a space where we can invite the policymakers and government and sort of local authorities into the app to see what people are really experiencing. So when they band around housing targets, that everyone in the industry is scratching their head going, where did they get that figure from? How the hell do they think they're going to achieve that? They can actually come in and, and talk to real developers on the ground who are, who are desperately trying to build more houses, but are being, you know, stuck or, or being... Uh, prevented from by the powers that be and and that's what we want to do is create a collective voice for the industry that hasn't been heard yet mm -hmm. yeah, and i think that is a big need in in particularly the way that you know landlord bashing you know nimbies you know all that sort of yeah, stuff yeah. it's it's so it's almost like that the odds are already stacked against you from day one that you know it's not straightforward to invest in property as it is but then you add all this pressure in from governments from societal you know pressures and everything else in between it's it's almost impossible to be an efficient business owner which is what you know at the end of the day property is all about it's about uh, you know making a bit of money providing value to a much needed yeah. sector that requires i think whatever it is four point odd million houses that we need in the uk it i think it just needs to be an area where people can go and we can develop like you know the developer show uk homes network we can start pushing together towards this goal which yeah. is making life easier for developers so that people can afford houses there's more more stock more availability more rental properties more ho owner occupiers because that's yeah. that's what we need it's not about getting rid of all the landlords they know it's all the landlords fault that we've got housing shortage which is utter utterly ridiculous but don't you think that that's the problem is that there are educators out there that are telling people that it's a uh, a get rich quick scheme yeah. and they're telling everyone that they can you know make this level of, of of income within 12 months when in reality if you speak to a proper landlord a property proper property developer it's a million miles away from the reality and if if people realized how difficult it is to get into property and then sustain you know just even a couple of of, of properties people might understand that that it's it's not people that are in in the industry just for, for greed alone. Obviously there's got to be an element of making some money to it, but if they understood how hard it was, um, you know, may, maybe we would have a better rap as a, as an mm -hmm. industry. There'd be more understanding of what goes into, to being a landlord and being a property investor and a developer that it's, yeah, I think there's polarizing personalities within the you know the sector that I, I won't mention any names because they yeah. don't deserve a shout out on this podcast but they i think hit the masses the the general public and that's then their view of what property professionals are but you know if they stepped into uk homes network and said landlords are utter you know criminals and they're yeah. you know stealing from the poor and all this you know stuff that people often comment on tiktoks they will get a response which is uh educated response in a sense of this is what we're providing this is the housing stock that we do this is how i am as a landlord this is how professional we are this is our setup the the response would not be what that individual expected and i think the majority of professional investors that are out there 
I'm not talking like institutional investors, you know, the big banks, the the private equity, the people like that, that maybe lose that quality of stock. I'm talking like SME landlords, you know, up to 50 units, anything above that is a, a different level again, but they're people that really care about the individuals that they've got in the house yeah. in most cases, not in every case, but in most cases. And it's that small select few that do ruin it for the whole industry because it's often the polarizing people that get the engagement, hit the algorithms, and that's then people's perception of what landlords are like. Yeah, and, yeah. and whereas obviously UK Homes Network, people can go and see whether it's governors, whether it's people that are looking to potentially get into property, they can go and see what the reality of property investing is. And I don't think you can get that anywhere else on planet Earth, on digital format, that is. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, what, what I've seen over the last 12 months is that people have been screenshotting what developers, planners, you know, people connected in the property industry have been saying on platforms like LinkedIn and then taking it over to Twitter. Mm -hmm and sharing the screenshots with some, you know, quite interesting captions. And then it's just a, a bunch of comments underneath that are saying that they're, they're greedy and they don't know what they're doing and they're making more homeless people and all this sort of stuff. But the reality is I go out networking nearly, you know, every other week to to face-to-face -face events. And the majority of the people in the room, there's there's one guy in particular, and I don't know, think he wants to be called out, so I, I won't say his name, but the only reason he got into property was to make enough money so that he could actually start rehoming the homeless. Mm -hmm. So now the guy's basically trying to create 70 units just to put in um, accommodation for, for homeless people that are living on the streets uh, in the Midlands. There's no other industry where I, I can think of where they're purposely trying to you know, make money to ensure that that money is then recycled back into the community, you know, give people a better, better homes to live in um, and, and generally raise the standards of living. Uh, I, I don't know anyone that that's doing that, that's purely motivated by earning enough money to ensure that that can happen. Mm. I mean, that's, that's the realities of genuine people in this industry. And we, it's full of, I know, I can name multiple people that are of similar mindset that are doing it for the right reasons and they set up stock in the right way and they're a good landlord and yeah, yeah. all that sort of stuff. I mean, for me, landlording, I didn't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the process. I prefer developing and flipping, but I know people that, and for me, well, I suppose on that point, you know, I'm creating good quality homes for people. I'm not cutting corners. I'm making sure that they're done properly and then providing good, housing stock that people can move in not like these new build developers <laughs> just scattergun approach and the quality of housing isn't but that's isn't quite there but that's where people's perspective or yeah i guess it is perspective of housing comes in they think oh well all developers must be like that but it's often the sme developers that are creating the best possible housing because their reputation is on the line in most cases because if they you know create a development that have got i don't know 20 houses that have done terribly need hundreds of snagging and then they set up another development scheme in the same area the chances are that people are going to talk within that area and then they're going to struggle to to sell that development because they cut corners on the last development and that yep. that's a difference we as an sme investor there's more on the line because you have reputational risk and i think yes there are institutional investors out there there's there should be um a good amount of regulation for that sort of stuff which there is plenty of regulation in this sector massive amount of regulation in fact but it's a, a, a blanket approach to what shouldn't be really a blanket approach because the approach that institutional investors landlords take versus what an sme landlord which is what i suppose the demographic is of the apps which i'm yeah, making yeah. this point are completely different and i think hopefully as people more people join the app they can get a feel that they're not just the only pe people that are doing it in the right way it's all about pushing i suppose the government or regulation in the right way as you've discussed to bring you know, politicians on, on the Apple regulators to see how, how it's actually working. And in most cases, not all cases, but in some cases it, it's not working. It, it's really hard for landlords and investors in certain cases. Yeah. There's a total disconnect, mm -hmm. total disconnect. And it, it, even, you know, we, we as an industry like to, or, or, or more widely like to, you know, say that the house builders are, 
the the bigger house builders may, maybe have it easier and they they definitely do because of the resources that they have mm. but when we talk about snagging lists and stuff that that's gone wrong with the properties it's because the 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 government and um other sort of you know industry regulators are, are pouring so much uh, reg regulation, legislation, sort of new goalposts on top of them, that if they were just given the opportunity to build quality homes and just focus on that, then, you know, as a, a, there would be a, a lot of good property stock. And I imagine the snagging list would go right down because they would be able to focus on those. Mm -hmm. But instead, we're now in a position where, you know, they're always looking for the next site. And how long that next site is going to take is based on how long the planning is going to take. And because the planning is so lengthy and so complicated and just sometimes completely obscure, they, that's where all the efforts go. So they've got to keep this conveyor belt of new properties coming. So it means that when the the old ones are or the new ones have completed and they're, they're done, the buyers have moved in and there's all these issues, it's not their first priority because they're, they're already looking on to the, to the next one. Mm -hmm. and, and that needs to change from a, a top level down, where if they were given um, a, little bit more, a little bit more convenience to actually build, then they wouldn't necessarily. But then you can, also, you, you can also look at how the SME developer is being treated at the moment, and all the focus seems to be on the top house builders and the levels of volume, where you know, the, the smaller guy who's doing 10 units, you know, every sort of six months, six, 12 months, he, he's just not given an opportunity to build and the planning is, is, is rejected in favor of a volume. So yeah, it's a, it's an absolute minefield. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's, um, unfortunately something we're not going to fix on this podcast. Sadly. <laughs> but I think if we can push together collectively, I think we can certainly, particularly as this, the labor government, I mean, you know, despite everything else that's going on with them, the the factor that they're focusing on, we need to develop more houses, I think is is really positive for yeah. for the sector. I think it is something that that needs reforming in, in in a massive way, not just like, oh, we'll change a few bits here and there. It needs like, let's start from scratch. This this process doesn't work, what we've got in place, particularly, I mean, more so from a planning perspective. It, it just, I mean, I'm like... 15, 16 months into a planning app for three units should be a hook, line and sinker, really. It's, it doesn't lend itself to being anything else other than development. There was mm. already two units on there, but we tweaked it to which uh, they were retaining the garage on the original planning permission. We're just trying to get another bungalow on that um, because the old buyer wanted to retain the garages for himself um, or the seller, sorry. So it should be literally straightforward. It should be like, all right, is the bungalow within parameters rather than the whole scheme because the two semis have already been accepted. It should literally just been really straightforward, but it's been 16 months. Hopefully we're due a decision in four days. So fingers crossed on that, but I'm not holding my breath. How, how long do you think that the minor changes have taken in comparison to the length of planning application? And how long do you think, how, how many houses could you have built in the time that it's taken? Oh. I mean, this is why SME developers over the last decade have exit the market because they just think, well, what's the point? Because we're not getting anywhere. We're, there's, it's more difficult now than it's ever been. And I think the compound effect of the, you know, the planning process and it taking so long, it, it I, I dread to think what the, the, the pipeline looks like from, you know, five years ago to now to in five years time, if nothing changes, it, it's only going to get worse and compound even further because there's going to be more planning apps. There's going to be more developers because that's naturally how, e you know, economies grow. They get bigger, more happens, there's more activity. And if it's already bottlenecked by a huge, you know, for me, 15, 16 months in my area, Imagine what it's going to be like in five years' time. Yeah. I, I'll have to put an app in now for five years' time. It's mental, isn't it? To get a decision in 20, 2030 almost. Yeah. It's just, but that's hopefully what our government can see. They can see that this is an issue and we need to reform it in a big way. And I think they need to lean on technologies, AI and, you know, all the other stuff that can fall into that because yeah. a lot of it, I think, can be automated in a way that, 
does it tick these boxes? Right, if it ticks these boxes, let's take it to a planning officer that can then review it from a human perspective just to make sure that the designs are right, that there's not been any any errors. So the, the pro, you cut out almost 50% of what a planning officer has to do by using AI that it is just tick box. Does it tick this box? Does it, is it in within regulations? Does it dimensions? Yeah. Is it overlooked? What's the, um, you know... Um, other uh, factors that play into a planning uh, application and then produce a result, which then can just be, yeah, perfect. Well, I, I know from first-hand experience that under a Labour government, they tend to be a lot better at, at making sure the houses are, are built. Um, not many people know this, but myself and my brother, who I started UK Homes Network, we, we were in Bista at the time Bista Village was built. And if you ever went there before, it was Bista Village, you know, the, the massive tourist attraction, the Disneyland of designer handbags. Before that, it was a village. It was a tiny little town. And within, I'd say, 10 years, it quadrupled in size. You've obviously got Bista Village that built there now, but the amount of houses that were being built, David Wilson, you mm-hmm. know, Barrett's Red Row, all, all back in the day were being built. And it was phase after phase after phase after phase. Um, and then after the Labour government, the houses stopped, but there's still plenty of land around there to build. But now, if you ask anyone that's from from Bicester, they'll tell you that Bicester is one of the main commuter towns into central London, despite being, you know, an hour's drive north. So we know that Labour can do this. Mm. They, I think there's just a little bit of naivety at the moment that they've they've not properly looked at the figures and they've they've promised big but I don't think they're going to achieve as big as they're saying immediately. They need to get to grips with the issue first. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, even if they get a percentage of what they're trying to achieve, then it's a step in the right direction. 100%, yeah. But um, yeah, it's not something that me and you are going to influence too much, but we'll do what we can certainly to help this sector. It depends. Angela, if you're watching. (laughs) (laughs) Listen to Chris. Yeah. (laughs) Great stuff. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Obviously, if people want to go and download the app, where can they go to to do that? Yeah. So if you you want to go to any of the major app stores, you can just search UK Homes with an S on the end, network, and it will come up straight away. Um, Or if you don't want to have another app on your phone, uh, you can use the web-based version. So you can just go to ukhomesnetwork.com and create a profile for free. Super. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on today, Chris, and uh, uh, certainly some rants in there, but hopefully uh, some good topic of conversation for people to follow. Cheers for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks very much for listening. Obviously, if you're listening to the audio version, please do leave a review. And if you listen on YouTube, please do like and subscribe. It certainly helps the podcast so we can continue to get amazing guests like Chris today. We'll see you on the next one. Take care.